So we had already talked about unification, and that's what the bell ringer was about, that you can type in Canvas chat, and then the media presentation. Don't forget to turn that in. The document, make sure you've typed 10 facts and five interpretations for each of those videos and submit the assignment. But as for the notes, today we'll be looking at national unrest. National unrest. And that starts with the Habsburg Empire. The Habsburg Empire. H-A-P-S-B-U-R-G. And of course, it was still an empire from the 40s through the 60s. And it definitely had an absolute ruler. But compared to the rest of Europe, it was fairly rural. It was agrarian or agriculture-based. Not only was it agriculture-based still, very little industry, but they also had been defeated by both France and Prussia. So they'd been humiliated twice within just a 15 years time span. Actually, less than a 10 year time span. So there are calls from reform. And so the Emperor Francis Joseph ends up establishing a legislature. So he does set up a legislature helping to appease some of the liberals. And in 1867, Francis Joseph also recognizes that Habsburg, or excuse me, Aust uh, Hungary, excuse me, Hungary will have control over its own state. And so from this point forward, it won't be known as the Habsburg Empire or the Austrian Empire. It will be known as Austria-Hungary. And there's a picture of Francis Joseph with his big fluffy hat. So now the Magyars had nationality. They had their own nation state, basically, that would be mostly controlled by Hungary, by themselves, but of course they're still under the reign of the Austrian ruler. So the other groups of people inside the Austrian Empire, the former Austrian Empire, actually opposed this because they said, wait, how come Hungary gets this recognition, but we don't? So that would include groups like the Romanians and the Croatians and so on. So they were actually opposed to it because they didn't think it was fair. They basically said, now we're going to be even lower on the totem pole because you have the Austrians and then the Hungarians, and then we're now in third, fourth, and fifth place. So the consequences of some of this nationalism would end up causing, of course, the two world wars that would be in the 20th century. The 20th Ooh. century. Mr. Smith, no. So Francis Joseph attempts to make some type of compromises. For instance, he recognizes both of the German and the Czech languages as being equal, for instance. The Magyars are the Hungarians. What's that again? Why are they called the Magyars? 
Because they use both those names. That's what they call themselves. Do they call their country Magyar? I don't. I honestly don't know what the name of their country is in their own language. Mongolia. Mongolia is north of China, so no. Mongolia. That's where Russia is north of China, too. <laughs> yes. Mongolia yes, it is. Uh, so is North Korea. Or most of China, anyway. But anyway, Francis Joseph just makes these kind of small compromises, but that isn't enough, of course, to appease all the different groups, especially since they wanted full independence in many cases. And here we can see a map with the various ethnic groups that exist in those territories. And you can see it's quite fractured with the different nationalities. Now let's turn our attention to Russia. Alexander II. A serfdom had been abolished which does allow the freedom of the people to move possibly, and they have certain legal rights. But of course, they don't necessarily have their own property. In fact, if they wish to own their own property, you know, the land that they've been living all this time, they have about 49 years that they have to pay, pay interest, basically, for the land that they've received. Locally throughout Russia, despite the fact this, that they have a czar who is an authority figure, there is a large amount of inefficiency in the governing of Russia. A lot of it is done locally by smaller groups or councils or provincial authorities, and so there's no consistency, a lot of uncertainty within most of Russia. But there is some judicial reform to initiate some of the Western civilization aspects, trials, juries, and so on. So that is one type of improvement. And there was military reform. Some of the old-fashioned discipline measures that were taken that were considered pretty brutal were gotten rid of. But of course you still had an authoritarian regime. And the criminal justice system was still harsh, and Russia's treatment toward Poland was also considered one of the greater tragedies of that time period. And so there, there would be people interested in reforming Russia, a sense of populism on helping the average people, and through the people's efforts, the possibility to reform was looked kindly upon, uh, but people were too afraid to bring this to the forefront because they knew any type of revolt that happened in the past resulted in it being brutally crushed. So you did have some people that tried to act on their own. There was an assassination attempt, for instance, of a military governor of St. Petersburg. And there was a terrorist group known as the People's Will that was created out of a small group of radicals that attempted to assassinate the czar. And in fact, they will eventually be successful. Yes? I don't think so. I mean, uh, well, you knew in this in a place like Russia, you knew who the overall ruler was. And the military governors, you knew who they were because they obviously practice harsh disciplinarian type of rule. So they were kind of a local tyrant. Uh, but it, like, um, like in the United States or Britain, did people know members of the House of Representatives or House of Commons? No, not really. But anyway, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated in 1881. The assassins 
threw a bomb and wounded some of the guards. The Tsar stopped his carriage, actually, to see if the guards had been wounded. He wanted to help them. And that's when, of course, he ended up being assassinated because they threw the other bombs at him then. So some people might think, oh, well, this will change everything. But actually, it had the opposite effect. Alexander III ended up being even more repressive than Alexander II would. And he rolled back most of the reforms that I just mentioned. And, of course, he ended up developing a significant system of secret police. Secret police, the people who never make things better. So, censorship, throwing people in prison, stopping the press from publishing critical articles, all of these types of things started to increase. So assassinating Alexander II was probably a bad idea. The second probably would have allowed these reforms to continue and grow, uh, but Alexander III felt that he had no choice but to reverse them after the second's death. In Great Britain, remember we had talked about the Chartists, and they signed a massive petition in order to get reforms put through Britain, uh, but they were slow to do this. But there would be some movement in 1867 with the Second Reform Act. The conservatives would agree to allow some working class males to vote. So some working people would be allowed to vote for the first time. This was their last ditch attempt because they knew the tide was turning and the prime minister, whose name is Disraeli, concerned about losing election, wanted to try to make some inroads with working class people. However, that failed, and instead the Liberal Party ended up winning a majority of the seats in the House of Commons, electing the new prime minister, William Gladstone. Gladstone. And Gladstone actually ended up being one of the better prime ministers, allowing for freedom of religion. He established exams, for instance, for entrance into the civil service, which meant it wouldn't be based on who you're related to, but by what type of experience and talent that you had. Not only did he establish the civil service reform, but he also helped with establishing the secret ballot to make sure that people didn't know who you voted for. So the secret ballot. Another item would be the Education Act of 1870. And this allowed for the establishment of government-run schools instead of those run by the church. And so there's a picture of Gladstone standing on the right, and the previous prime minister, of course, they would trade places, Benjamin Disraeli is seated in the front there. And that's basically the same way if you watched uh, on C-SPAN a couple times a week, they have prime minister's questions. And that's the way pretty much parliament works. The speaker is sitting there in the back. The ceremonial aspects are right there in the center. The prime minister sits on the left-hand side. And the leader of the opposition sits on the right-hand side. And of course, eventually, Disraeli comes back in as prime minister and he attempts to establish his own reforms, including the Public Health Act. And also housing reform, making sure that working class people had somewhere to live. 
Gladstone becomes prime minister again. And in 1880, he, of course, has to deal with the problem of Ireland. The Irish people, of course, also invigorated by this sense of nationalism, would like their independence, and so some compromises have to be made. The Irish are allowed to control local government, for instance. Irish Catholics no longer have to pay a tax to the Church of England. And any Irish people who had been evicted by the British would receive payment and rights for their future claim. But despite all these changes, uh, the British also passed the Coercion Act, which basically says they're allowed to do whatever they want to keep order in Ireland. But home rule, allowing Ireland to completely govern itself, uh, would not pass until much later. So that's all about the unrest. Tomorrow we'll talk about European supposed supremacy. And for the remainder of the time, turn in that media file if you haven't already or the reading or any of the other assignments from Unit 7 that I notified you about.